Hello, I'm Allison Davis with EPA's Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards. We're here today to talk about the agency's new standards for sulfur dioxide, or SO2. With me today is Dr. Michael Stewart, an Environmental Protection Specialist in our Health and Environmental Impacts Division. Michael, uh, tell us about this new standard that we issued in June of 2010. Sure, so I'll talk about our, our existing standards and how our new standard is going to replace those existing standards. Uh, we had a 24-hour standard and an annual standard and both of those standards are now being replaced by a one hour standard. And what we say it's a 99th percentile one hour daily maximum standard. And that one hour standard, it, we put a one hour standard into place because we really believe that it better reflects the health information about the health effects that SO2 causes. That a one hour standard will protect better against health effects caused by sulfur dioxide than the 24 hour or the annual standard. And this is the first major revision to the SO2 standards in, in nearly 40 years. Wow, when was the last standard issued? Uh, 1971. You were talking about the importance of a one-hour standard for protecting health. What are the health effects of SO2? So the health effects of SO2 come from ma two main bodies of evidence that were evaluated during this NACS review. First were controlled human exposure studies. Controlled human exposure studies are, are what they sound like. They took uh, asthmatic volunteers, mild and moderate asthmatic volunteers, and they were exposed to defined concentrations of SO2 while at exercise. And when you do these studies, what you find is that when you expose these asthmatics while at exercise to SO2, you see um, two main health effects, both respiratory symptoms like cough, chest tightness, that kind of thing, and also uh, decrements in lung function, meaning that they're, they're not breathing as, as well as they could be breathing. What about the other types of studies? The other types of studies that we looked at are epidemiology studies, and these studies are done in the population, and they look for uh, associations between SO2, and, and typically um, these include more serious health effects. So for instance, there were positive associations between uh, exposure to ambient concentrations of SO2 and uh, health effects such as emergency department visits, hospitalizations. So in the epidemiology studies, you really you, you see these associations between more serious health effects than you would be able to observe in a chamber study, these controlled human exposure studies. Okay. Um, so we're adding the one-hour standard. What are we doing with the old standards? The 24-hour and the annual standards are both being revoked. Um, they're being revoked because we, we did analyses during the course of the review and we, and we showed that um, if you have our one hour standard at a level of 75 parts per billion, which is the level of the new one hour standard, then the existing 24 hour and annual standards wouldn't provide any additional public health protection, it's believed. Therefore, those standards were going to be revoked. Okay. Um, so you've talked about the primary standard. Normally when the agency issues national ambient air quality standards, you also do a standard to protect the environment and the public welfare, but you didn't set a secondary standard this time. Why not? This, this review that was just completed was just for the primary or the health-based standards for mm -hmm. sulfur dioxide. There is a review ongoing right now for SO2, for the secondary effects of SO2, and that's being done jointly with a review of the secondary effects for nitrogen dioxide, or NO2. Uh, the proposal for the secondary review is going to be in July of 2011, okay. and the final agency should issue a final action by March of 2012. Michael, thank you so much for joining us thank today. You. We've just heard about the health effects of SO2 and the agency's new one-hour SO2 standard. Now we're going to turn to the steps needed to put this new standard into place. With me are Dr. Larry Wallace, an environmental protection specialist with our Air Quality Policy Division and the lead on implementation for the SO2 standard. Next to him is Nielsen Watkins, a physical scientist with the Air Quality Assessment Division and an expert on monitoring. Beside Nielsen, is Dr. James Thurman, also a physical scientist in the Air Quality Assessment Division, and James is a modeling expert. Nielsen, let's turn to you first. When we issued the SO2 standard in June of 2010, we also issued new monitoring requirements. Can you tell us a bit about those? Certainly I can. Uh, we, with our final agency action, we did uh, create new monitoring requirements for SO2 monitors. And what we've done is we've tried to take, uh, require SO2 monitors in urban areas, more specifically core-based statistical areas, or CBSAs, where we have uh, relatively more people and more SO2 emissions in the same place or in the same area. And, and our, our, our uh, requirements are, are based on that premise. 
So are you saying that you're trying to make sure the monitors are located where people are most likely to be exposed? That's correct. Well, again, in support of the new standard, we're trying to bring monitors where people may be more at an exposure risk. Okay. So what will this result in? Are there going to be more monitors? So this rulemaking actually introduced requirements where we have had none. Uh, the only time we've been requiring monitors uh, prior to this rulemaking were at national core monitoring sites or in-core sites, which are multi-pollutant sites, which were introduced and required back in 2006. So aside from the NCOR, we're now introducing requirements where we had none. Uh, we are doing that through the use of a population-weighted emissions index. And this index takes into account, again, the population of an urban area and the SO2 emissions that are occurring in that urban area to require some number of monitors. Okay, so um, is that going to be more monitors, fewer monitors? How will that shake out? All right, we, we've had a on the order of 400 to 500 monitors operating in the in the past years, even though they weren't required, and we don't we don't anticipate that that number will drop significantly. What we've done is, based on information we provided in the rulemaking, using 2008 census estimates and at the time which was current the 2005 national emissions inventory. So again, using those two estimates, which will change in the future, um, we estimated we would have 163 monitors required in 131 CBSAs. Now again, that number is less than the number I just mentioned that are have been running, uh, but all that does is basically bring in a, a minimum requirement, a, a higher floor, if you will, of number of monitors that must be operating at any time. So for some of our state partners out there, could this result in simply having to move a monitor rather than to purchase a new one? Yeah, in many cases it will be. In fact, in we estimated that approximately uh, maybe around 50 monitors would have to be moved into an urban area that, is, that has a requirement or a new site might have to be established in that urban area if there's not an existing site that they could move an SO2 monitor into. Anytime there's a change to a monitoring network, there are also some costs involved. Who's going to pay for these network changes? Uh, these network changes will be paid for in the routine mm -hmm. manner that most uh, networks are introduced and then operated and maintained over the long term through state and local air grant funds and this network will also be funded in that through that mechanism or through those mechanisms. Okay. Um, Nielsen, I understand that regional administrators may require some additional monitoring in some cases. Is that correct? And if it is, tell us a little bit about that. So when applying a, a network design to the entire country you know, there, there's always going to be special cases and situations where the rule may or may not exactly uh, account for what we want to have done. And so we have regional administrator authority to require monitoring above the minimum in certain cases. And a certain case may be where an area does not have required monitoring, but there may be a number of small sources or, or some other uh, situationally unique case where uh, we have suspicions that there may be SO2 concentrations that are approaching or even exceeding the NAAQS level. And in those type situations, even though a state or local may be meeting their minimum monitoring requirements, maybe there might be uh, a, another mar monitor warranted in that particular case. And so the RA authority gives us that ability to work with states to potentially take care of that issue by having a monitor brought into that particular situation. So when we issue new monitoring requirements, there are also reporting requirements that come along with that. Did any reporting requirements change with this rule? They did. Uh, typically, states will report a one-hour average concentration to the air quality system, or AQS. Um, for this rulemaking, we actually uh, took another step. Uh, we, Because of the reliance and, and use of five-minute data, uh, in the uh, setting of the health standard. Um, and because the one hour standard is actually protecting against exposures that range from anywhere from 24 hours down to five minutes, the five minute data that had been previously volunteered by some states over the previous uh, five to 10 years was very, very valuable. And so as a result, we, we, we saw the value added by having five minute data. Uh, we considered what the standard was actually intending to protect against from five minutes up to 24 hours. And we required that states 
report the one hour average of SO2 concentrations and also the maximum five minute average that occurs in a one hour period in addition. So that's two different values per hour that states are now required to report. When do these changes have to be in place? So the data reporting aspect, the five minute data reporting aspect is, is ongoing now. That was required 60 days after promulgation of the rule. Uh, the monitoring side of things, uh, that has two pieces to it. The first piece is the annual monitoring plan that states submit every year, typically in July of the year, that says here's what their network is doing and so forth. So the monitoring plan that is to address any required monitoring is due in July of 2011. The monitoring actually has to be operate, the monitoring component, the, the physical operation of monitors has to be in place by January 1st of 2013. Now we're going to move from monitoring to modeling, which is also a component of the rule that we issued in June of 2010. James, this rule requires a combination of monitoring and modeling in order for states to demonstrate compliance. Why is that? Well, modeling is going to be used for several purposes. Um, the first purpose will be to identify NACS violations and determine compliance in areas that don't have monitors currently. And also that modeling can be used to identify sources in the area that cause or contribute to a NACS violation. Now, because of the nature of this standard, placing a single monitor at a location may not pick up the maximum concentration. That's because this is a short-term standard, one hour, and SO2 is primarily emitted from stationary sources and the effects are, tend to be localized. So for a given hour, if you have a monitor you know, away from the source, the wind may not be blowing from the mo uh, source to the monitor and it may not pick up the maximum concentration. So the only way through monitoring to pick up maximum concentrations would be to have a ring of monitors around the source which would then pick up the maximum concentration for, you know, for every hour, but that's a lot of monitors, that's not very cheap and that's not very practical. So modeling can fill that role because it's cheaper to do modeling simulations and you can place receptors all around the source to get maximum concentration. When you're, when you're using modeling, is there always a monitor involved? Not always. Okay. So if you can demonstrate compliance through modeling, why do you need monitors? Well, monitors will be used in areas where you have a confluence of sources where their plumes overlap and the monitor can pick up those sources, so you may not need modeling. Also, there are areas that are complex terrain, complex meteorology, monitoring may be better than modeling. Okay. And monitoring can also be used to establish background concentrations that will be used later with the modeling. Okay. Uh, has EPA ever taken an approach like this before where you use both monitoring and modeling? Yes, uh, with SO2, air quality management has favored dispersion modeling for NACS compliance. And actually, in areas that even have a non violating monitor, the modeling still has to show no violations for the area to be in attainment. And given the short term nature of the standard, it's even more, modeling becomes even more important. So tell me, if modeling is helpful for SO2, why don't we require this for all the NACs pollutants? That's a good question. Um, the different pollutants have different characteristics and averaging times. Pollutants such as ozone is regional in nature. Monitor will pick up all those sources as they overlap. Uh, lead, which is also a localized pollutant like SO2, has a longer averaging time, you know, rolling three months. So wind direction variation hour by hour does not matter as much as it would for SO2. So SO2 is rather unique in that short-term standard and localized effects. What kind of instruction is EPA giving the states about doing this, mo this modeling work? Well, we've just issued guidance to help the states with the modeling to show them how to calculate design values and how to compare the results to the design value and the next design value and how to incorporate background concentrations. James, thank you very much. And for those of you watching, we will be talking more about that draft guidance in a webinar. Now I'd like to turn to Larry Wallace, who is going to tell us more about the implementation phase of this new standard. And we always start with the designations process. So Larry, when, are, when is EPA going to make designations for SO2? Yes, designations is everybody's favorite. Uh, well, uh, in terms of uh, designations, EPA has up to two years to do the designations under the Clean Air Act. Uh, we also have uh, one additional year that we can take if there is insufficient information to do the designations. However, in this case, we plan to do the designations by June of 2012, two years after the promulgation of the NACs. Okay. So once the designations are made, when are SIPs going to be due, and how long do areas have to meet the standards? 
Well, once designations are made, uh, states have, uh, under this circumstance, uh, 18 months to submit the SIPs, uh, and they have up to five years to attain the standard after that. Um, you said five years after that. Um, just to clarify, is that five years after the SIPs are due? Well, areas that are designated as non-attainment have five years to attain the standard after they have been designated uh, non-attainment. Okay. Okay, Larry, I understand that states are also going to have to submit SIPs for areas that are designated as unclassifiable. What is that going to entail? Uh, that's correct, uh, and that's something that we haven't uh, required states to do previously, but the requirement has always been there. In this particular case, we felt that it was appropriate given the approach that we're taking in terms of compliance with the standard, in, in terms of using both monitoring and modeling. Uh, in this particular case, um, states will actually submit SIPs for uh, areas that are designated as unclassifiable, uh, and in these are areas where uh, there's insufficient information to determine whether the area should be designated as non-attainment or attainment. Okay. And uh, in this particular case, uh, these SIPs will be submitted under Section 110A1 of the Clean Air Act, and under that section, um, the Clean Air Act requires states to submit this SIP three years following promulgation of the NACs. So, uh, states will have to submit this SIP uh, no, no later than June of 2013. Larry, just to refresh people's memories, um, tell us the dates for um, submitting SIPs for non-attainment areas and the dates for the unclassifiable areas. Uh, well, uh, the date for submitting SIPs for non-attainment areas, areas designated as non-attainment, is uh, 18 months after the area is designated as non-attainment. Uh, the areas that are designated as unclassifiable uh, they have to submit SIPs no later than three years after promulgation, and this is under Section 110 of the Clean Air Act. Larry, let's talk a bit about PSD, Prevention of Significant Deterioration. PSD is another favorite topic, if you will. Is the agency going to issue additional guidance on PSD permitting as it relates to SO2? Uh, actually, Allison, we have already done that uh, following the promulgation of the NACs in June. Uh, we develop a guidance memo which addresses this issue. Uh, the guidance actually addresses the issue of uh, the uh, screening tools for SO2, and there are, there are three screening tools. Uh, the first one is significant emission rates, which we call SER. Mm -hmm. The next is uh, significant monitoring concentrations, which we call SMC. And the final one is the significant impact levels, which we call SIL. And that particular guidance addressed those issues, and in terms of uh, SER and SMC, uh, what we stated is that the current guidance as it relates to that will continue to be in effect. What about the significant impact levels? Well, what we did there is we developed an interim uh, SILS uh, to be used for the moment, but we are planning on uh, developing a SILS for the future, which will be permanent. Okay. All right. Um, you know, one last thing. Michael Stewart had mentioned earlier in the broadcast that we are going to revoke the previous annual and 24-hour standards for SO2 now that we have the one-hour standard. When is that going to occur? Well, actually, uh, in, in terms of transitioning from the old standard to the new, uh, in order to prevent any uh, lack of public health protection, we decided to keep those standards in place for a short period of time. Uh, in this particular case, uh, the standards will remain in effect uh, for what, for, in most areas for one year following the uh, designation for areas for the revised standard for SO2. Um, in, other, in other cases where we have areas that were non-attainment prior to the promulgation of the new standard uh, and areas where we have SIP calls that were in place but uh, the states didn't actually um, finalize the, the issues related to that, uh, the SIPs, uh, uh, the standard will remain in place for those particular areas until those issues are resolved, and the states must also submit uh, uh, a SIP which addresses the new standard. And once we receive that and it's, it's approved, uh, then the standard can be revoked. All right. Larry, thank you very much. I'd like to thank my guests today, Dr. Michael Stewart, Dr. Larry Wallace, Nielsen Watkins, and Dr. James Thurman. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Allison Davis with EPA's Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards.